It's been 40 years since U.S. President Richard Nixon signed the National Cancer Act, promoting the work of the National Cancer Institute. Since then, clinical care has really changed. Overall, U.S. cancer mortality rates began to decline in the 1990s, though for some cancers, things haven't improved. An estimated 350,000 people in the United States died in 2010 from the seven deadliest cancers. Who gets cancer and what causes it? There are clues in people's genomes, and researchers have identified many environmental factors, carcinogens, that can cause the mutations that lead to cancer. And perhaps the greatest accomplishment in cutting down on the incidence of cancer has been in prevention, limiting or eliminating exposures to carcinogens. But in looking at genomes of individual cancers, it's increasingly clear that there are certain mutations in particular genes that drive cancer's development. Now for each individual cancer, each individual cancer clone, we believe that it requires multiple different driving genes. So that certainly applies to the common adult epithelial cancers, such as cancers of the breast or the prostate or the lung. We believe that in each of those cancers, a number of different genes has to be operative in a single case. The number that is often bandied around is around maybe five different cancer genes operating in each case. It's possible that in some cancers there are more, and it's also thought that perhaps in some cancers, particularly of the uh, blood system, some leukemias, it may re each individual cancer may require fewer than five, possibly only one. Where researchers have found just one or a few genes that drive a particular cancer's growth, such as chronic myeloid leukemia, they've gone on to design drugs that target the molecular machinery of that cancer and stop it from growing. And we now know over the last six to seven years um, with inhibitors against other drivers in cancers such as lung cancer, sarcoma, melanoma, uh, glioblastoma, kidney cancer, that we can see dramatic clinical re responses with a single drug targeting a single driver. But cancers change over time, they evolve, and they can become resistant to these targeted therapies. And there may be other factors that contribute to a cancer's ability to spread or grow. RNA expression, microRNAs, proteins, splicing variants, metabolites, you know, do we need to know all this in order to make an intelligent decision? Um, I think we, it's going to depend on the tumor and, uh, and the mutation, uh, but there's no doubt that the other variables all impact um, how the tumor will progress and respond to treatment. The, uh, the challenge is you can't really wait for all the other technologies to sort of reach maturity uh, at the same level that DNA sequencing now has. So the idea is that a patient comes to see the doctor, they're diagnosed with cancer. The doctor takes a biopsy, a sample of their tumor or cancer, and tests it. They test it for genetic mutations that might be driving the growth of the cancer. And then they can give that patient a drug matched to the particular mutations that are important in their cancer. Or the doctor may need to give the patient a combination of drugs because there's more than one mutation driving the growth of their cancer. It's the same idea that's used with AIDS patients who receive a cocktail of drugs for to stop the HIV virus. And one example where this is being done is with chronic myeloid leukemia. Charles Sawyers is working on ways to, to give patients with that disease a cocktail of drugs. There's some compelling cocktail ideas, um, but we've only got one of the two or three ingredients we need to stir the cocktail up correctly. One drug's still experimental, whereas one is already approved, or one we just don't even have the drug yet. Uh, so that's why um, I'm giving you an answer that's not very satisfying. The science is telling us to do these cocktails, but we just don't have all the ingredients on the shelf yet. 
But getting that therapy to work and getting it to endure are two separate things. These cocktails of cancer drugs may work for a while. They may extend a patient's life by many more months, but eventually their tumor is probably going to develop resistance to the combinations. In lung cancer, um, an inhibitor to one driver can be overcome either by mutation of the driver, as in the leukemia example, or by something we call oncogene bypass, where another driver, which wasn't driving, gets into the driver's seat and takes over, and therefore you need an inhibitor that would work against the second driver. It's still a cocktail strategy. You just have to know who's driving. So doctors may have to keep testing their tumor for genetic changes and giving them a tailored cocktail every time they start to resist the previous combination of drugs. And one thing that will help is finding more mutations, more genetic weak spots in tumors by systematically sequencing a lot of cancers. And that's what Mike Stratton is working on with his team. So if we are interested, and I think we should be, in finding genes that are relatively infrequently mutated, but nevertheless driver genes contributing to cancers, we then have to analyze not 10 cancers, but 100. And for some of these genes, 1,000. And that is at the core of the current initiatives to sequence cancer genomes, to do really quite substantial numbers so that we then access more or less the full repertoire of cancer genes, whether they are operating commonly in one or more types of cancers or rarely. The advantage of the targeted cancer drugs compared to standard chemotherapy is that they're much less toxic. Chemotherapy targets all dividing cells in the body, and so it can be extremely toxic, while the targeted cancer drugs tend to act only on the tumor cells, and so there are far fewer side effects. The downside to the targeted therapies is that cells will inevitably develop resistance because there will always be a few cells in the tumor that have some gene that allows them to resist the drug. And so the tumor will evolve and eventually evade the drug. And so the doctor may have to get the patient another, a different drug to target the mutated resistant form of their tumor. And this can take only a few months for this resistance to develop while developing each new drug can take 10 to 15 years. So, Many current cancer therapies do appear to be converting cancers into chronic diseases rather than acutely killing diseases. However, what should be our aspiration? Our aspiration should be ultimately to kill the cancer cells. Our aspiration should be to achieve cure. And this is not just banner waving. We know that it can be done. It's not so much from the recent advances in targeted cancer therapeutics, but we know from the much earlier advances in cancer chemotherapy, the advances in the leukemias, particularly of childhood, the advances in testicular cancer of young men, where previous diseases which had extremely high mortality now have 90% cures because of cancer chemotherapeutics that kill all the cancer cells. So it can be achieved, and that is still what we should be aspiring to. What we need to understand much better is why we achieved those successes those decades ago in the leukemias and testicular cancers, and what are the differences between those cancers and those treatments compared to other cancers and the targeted treatments we're using today. I see the, the future, uh, really, it should be the present uh, encounter with an oncologist as um, a, a combination of an interaction with the patient and a detailed molecular analysis of the tumor at diagnosis. Science is published by AAAS, the Science Society.